start with the end in mind. Define what what success looks like. How does it feel? Like, what's your perfect day feel like? And like, what do you want your life to really look like and feel like in five, 10 years? Really define what that looks like and feels like. And then, and then work backwards and say, okay, to get there in 10 years, I need to add $1,000 a month in passive income each year. How many properties do I need to, to add a thousand dollars a month. So if it's two fifty per property, then I need to buy four properties per year. Okay, that's my that's my goal for this year. Welcome to the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast. My name is Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach, and this is a show all about investing in real estate, achieving financial independence, and doing more of what matters. Whether you're a long-time listener or a brand new listener, it's always an honor for me to have you here listening to another episode. The topic of today's episode is how to build a $10,000 per month income from rental properties. This is an interview with Kyle McCorkle. He blogs over at the website Real Life Rentals. And I had a lot of fun with this interview for a couple of reasons. One was that we had the exact same goal with real estate investing. When I first started, was having a $10,000 per month income. And I always wondered, how do you do that? And I actually wrote a, lot, wrote a lot about that on my blog. My book, Retire Early with Real Estate, was showing that way you build wealth and how do you create this income stream over time. And Kyle does an excellent job on his website, but also in this interview of documenting how he's doing it, of running the numbers. He actually has an ongoing spreadsheet on his site showing how much income he has. He's not quite to that $10,000 per month uh, income level consistently, but we talk about how do you track that number? How do you build a portfolio? And he started off as a full-time job, working another job and having to invest on the side. So we talked about how he started doing that when he first started buying rental properties, but he's evolved. He's now a full-time real estate investor and enjoys that process of going out and buying deals. So he wholesales some properties, he flips some properties. We talk a lot about marketing. How do you find good deals, even in a, a tough market like this when it's really competitive? And then we, how do you transfer all of that energy and all that deal finding into these rental properties that can produce almost like a fruit tree that produces fruit for the rest of your life. That's what these rental properties can do. And so we talk about that the nature of how that works, how that income works, how much do you really need? And we get into all those kind of nitty gritty spreadsheet type details. So if you're that kind of person and you like the nitty gritty of this real estate investing business, that's what we're going to talk about in today's episode. So without any more delay, let's get started with my interview with Kyle McCorkle. Hey, Kyle, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Chad. Yeah, this is awesome. I've been excited about connecting with you. I think I've, I've been following you or we've connected online, primarily on Twitter in the past and really love what you're doing with your website, Real Life Rentals. So I'm gonna put a link to that in the show notes so people can check it out with all the details on every single rental you've got, cash flow numbers. We're gonna, we're gonna jump into that, but it's a really cool website. Um, so well done on that. Um, I want to talk about a lot of stuff. But right now, before we even got on this call, you were talking to a seller. So you're, you're, in the, you're in the middle of a lot of just marketing and wholesaling and flipping, and you've got rentals as well. So I want to get into that. But I thought it'd be cool to take a step back. One of the uh, things I talk a lot about in the show is financial independence. And you had on your website, you talk about your, you have a really clear goal is that you want to make $10,000 per month in rental income. So I was hoping you could talk about that because I think a lot of people will resonate with that kind of end goal that you're you're trying to shoot for. Yeah, sure. So um, just got got started kind of building the rental portfolio f- um, six years ago now, and uh, yeah, I mean we we pretty much just started with with the end in mind and just uh, kind of mapped out what we're currently spending, what we think we're going to be spending in the future. Um, had to add kids in there, add a bigger house in there uh, add like a buffer for travel and fun and just whatever, um, had to make sure we accounted for insurance and stuff like that. Uh, and yeah, so it seems, it seemed like 10,000 was a, was a good, a good goal to, to, to shoot for. So, um, and then, you know, when I started buying rentals and I would say, okay, well on paper, you know, this four unit or, or whatever it looks like it should cash flow $400 per, per month. But, um, what I was finding was, uh, well, the, the actual cash flow is way different than what I expected. And, um, I'm, I'm an engineer my wife's an engineer. And I, I find, I found myself to uh, wanting to kind of prove to myself and prove to my wife as well, 
that, hey, over the long term, this is going to perform at $400 a month, but we're going to have some ups and downs. Um, So that was kind of why I wanted to start tracking it. So then we could say, okay, um, we've had some ups and downs, but on a pro forma basis, you know, this is how we can expect to perform. And this is how many more units we're going to need to buy that are performing at that rate to get up to that 10,000. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, so many people start with that number and it's a good place to start, right? To say, this is my lifestyle. This is why I want to do this. Is, this is what matters to me, which I talk a lot about on the show. Like these are the lifestyle things that I want to do. But then you translate it to a number, 10,000 per month. What you've done, in the, what I love about your website is you're connecting and you're showing the numbers about is this really happening or not? And so you have you have this right. this kind of dashboard that shows month by month. Some months is 6,000, one month, I think you hit 10,000 recently. Is that correct? Yeah. So yeah. Congr- but that congr- was, but that was one time. Like I want to, yeah. I want to hit 10,000 yeah. every single month. Yeah. yeah. So, so talk to me about those key metrics. So you're an engineer, you track this stuff. Like what, what are some of the things that if you had to look at almost like a dashboard on an airplane, like the most correct. important things that you would track on a, on a daily monthly basis, what, what, what are the things that you are most important for you and your, your financial world? Sure. So I, I like to track for rentals. I like to track obviously the monthly cash flow. Um, and then I, I also like to track the, um, how much money I have in the deal. So really what I want to see is that I'm getting a good return on, on my money. Um, and that's basically, uh, that's the cash on cash return. So, um, Kind of when I got started, I was I was buying more turnkey rentals, and the cash on cash return was more like eight ten percent. Um, and then lately, I've been doing a lot of burrs where I can pull most, if not all, of my principal out. And um, and on those, it's I'm getting cash on cash of hundred percent or infinity. So um, I would say those are the those are the two big metrics. But um, I mean, if you if you go on my website, I'm looking at what what the debt pay down is looking like, how much current equity I, I have in the property. Um, I look at what the property was last appraised for. So I, I like to kind of know what my equity position is, what my loan to my current loan to value is. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause that that might show opportunities for for selling as well. Like um, if I have a lot of equity in a property, but not a lot of cash flow, uh, that could be an opportunity to, to sell that property, do a 1031 exchange into another property that's cash flowing much, much more. No, that's smart. Very smart. And so we, we mentioned a couple of definitions right there. So let, let, just in case somebody hasn't heard of that, you mentioned turnkey, you mentioned Burr strategy. Would you mind unpacking each one of those just a little bit? So just a basic definition so people know what you're talking about. Yeah. So, um, I guess on, in a broader sense, I would consider turnkey to just mean that it doesn't need any, any repairs. So it could, I mean, you you could buy it anywhere. You could buy it, buy it off, off the market. You know, if it's listed with an agent, um, there's turnkey companies out there that, that you, they'll, they'll flip it to you off market. Um, so, and they, that, you know, they call that a, a, a turnkey property, which I, I, I have bought a couple of those in, in the past, um, back when I was working my full-time job and time, time was at a premium. Um, so we, we talked about turnkey. What, what was the other question? The, the burst strategies to so just explain the, what that stands for. Yep. So like I said, uh, when I was working my full-time job, time was at, at a premium and then, uh, when I started kind of working towards uh, going into real estate full time, I was like, well, I'm going to have all this time. Um, I'm going to invest my time in, in, into these properties. And and as as the trade off would be that I'm going to have less money invested in, in these properties. So the, the Burr strategy is you buy, you rehab, you rent and you refinance. So let's say I, so my, let's just take, take my first one that I, that I did. I bought it for, I think it was 37,000. I put, uh, 40,000 in rehab into it. So I I was in it for 77,000. I got it appraised to get a mortgage. Um, and I, let's just say it was 
a hundred thousand. I think it was a little less, but just to make the numbers easy. So praise for a hundred thousand, I get a loan for 80,000. And now I pay back that 77 that I invested in it. And now I have no money in the deal. So, so um, and then, and now I have a rental property that's cash flowing, you know, two or $300 a month. So when we go back to the returns, you kind of threw out the turnkey, you might've been making a eight to 10% cash on cash return, which you're, you're tracking very closely. The Burr deals, in the, your example, if you had $80,000 loan and you pulled out and you had none of your own money invested because you pulled it all back out, then in the, over the long run, you've just in six months, you've pulled out 100% of your money. So you there, there's an infinite return. That's when you said that. You're not, you have no money invested, yet you're making two or $300 per month. Correct. That's, that's a, so was, was that a light bulb moment for you where you're like, wait a minute, what's, how, how does this work? That was a total, so I, it was something that I've been learning about, you know, cause I, I like, like most people, I was consuming podcasts all, all, all the time. Um, I was traveling for work. And so as I was kind of driving around the country, um, going to different consulting gigs, um, I was listening to bigger pockets or just other, other, um, real estate podcasts. Um, so I, I learned about the birth strategy and just never kind of pursued it for, for myself. But, um, I would say the light bulb was after I did that was, oh, wow, I could, I could do this full time, you know, I, cause I was working on one and, um, I was like, okay, that, that, that one was good. Uh, it, it, it worked. I've proved the concept. Uh, so now how do I do, two at a time? How do I do three at a time? How do I do uh, multiple units at a time? Do a three unit and a two unit and a four unit and a five unit all at once. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of proving it, proving it on a small scale uh, to, to prove that it's possible to do on a larger scale. Yeah. And I, I like that you had kind of one foot in the I'm working full time. I don't have a lot of time. I've got to do a turnkey rental deal. That was kind of how you got started. You started dipping your toes in this world of more the entrepreneurial real estate. It's the way I think of it, where you're finding totally. good deals. And so I, I guess let's, let's go back to like your, your big picture goal is to get to $10,000 per month. If you were somebody, and there's a lot of people in this, in this, this kind of situation, you're working a full-time job, you're making pretty good money at that full-time job, you're saving money. Let's just talk about that path of, of buying those turnkey rentals yeah. and, maybe, and maybe what that looks like. And then we'll go back to what you've chosen to do. So like if, if somebody like your original path, let's just buy a rental turnkey. Let's make a down payment. You know, what, what's, what's the kind of big picture strategy to go from zero to I have $10,000 per month in that scenario? Right. So to me, I think there's nothing wrong with that. If, if you're, if you're good at your job, if you like your job and you're making really good money and if you're, um, you're able to, to, to save a lot of money by, by doing that. Um, I, I think there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, working your job, you know, let's say you make $10,000, $10, $10,000 a month, um, in your, in your job and you're living on five, uh, and you're, you're banking $5,000 a month. Well, you could buy a hundred thousand dollar property every what, four or five months. Um, that's going to then provide two to three hundred dollars more in cash flow to you. Then you can kind of add that onto the top, and you know you buy a couple of those, and now now maybe you could buy one of those hundred thousand dollar properties every two months. Um, and I mean, honestly, I think if you have a good property manager, if you if you have a good team, um, I think you could just keep doing that. Uh, so I I think there's nothing wrong with with that strategy. Um, it's just, I, I, I feel like you have to know yourself. Um, for me, I am naturally an entrepreneur. I, I like to run my own show. I, I get excited by building a team and kind of being in the weeds with sellers and bankers and contractors. Um, that just like gets me, gets me fired up. Um, so it, I, I, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. I love my job as well, but I just, I always, always knew eventually I want to be running my own show. Mm. It reminds me a little bit. I don't know if I read the, this is kind of a different financial world, but I read the, the book by Benjamin Graham. Um, I trust the name of the it's Warren Buffett recommended it. And it's, uh, it's Benjamin Graham's main book. In any case, 
he always talked about in stock investing is very similar. Like there are, there are some people who should just go buy like a portfolio of index funds. At that time, he wasn't talking about portfolio of index funds, but just passive kind of investors who have a full-time job, save their money, invest consistently, like dollar cost averaging. And that's kind of what totally. I'm thinking with the turnkey rentals. Oh, there's, totally. other, there's other people who the kind of path you took and definitely the path I took as well. And this is like the Warren Buffett path in stocks is that you spend all day, your business is looking for deals, is, totally. is anal analyzing properties. And so it's really just, I love how you said it. So you have to know yourself and say, where am I in my life right now? At yep. your beginning, your beginning, you didn't have a lot of time. So you got started and dipped your toe in turnkey rentals. You had a good, uh, good income. You had good credit. So it made sense to use some leverage Absolutely. with turnkeys, save your money. So like that path is legitimate, right? There's, people could do that. There's good returns. The other path you took though, and let's, let's talk a little bit more about that, the entrepreneurial path. What, what are some of the, so the upside is you can buy these deals at much cheaper prices if you start hunting for them. So you can buy these these bird deals that you might have 70, 80% in. Um, right. you're, you're buying equity day one. What's the, you know, not the catch, but just what's, what's the, how do, how do you have to pay your dues to get to that? Like what's the obstacle, the challenge to getting from zero to like actually doing that business model? Right, so actually kind of the way I think of it, the way I'm set up now is um, because I'm doing wholesaling and flipping, which is very active um, and I'm having to hustle. So I, that's my entrepreneurial business right now. And so I, I, I kind of think of it as um, I was consulting before. I, I was an industrial engineering consultant. Now I'm a real estate consultant. So I, I, I help sellers and I, I, I consult with them and try to provide them with solutions on how to best sell their house. Um, so I, I really totally did just trade one job for another. I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of that. Um, but uh, so the wholesaling and the flipping is kind of my job right now. And um, so that's, that's the catch is it's, it's gonna be a job. You do still have to work for that money. Now the way I have the reason that I have it set up that way is because the wholesaling and the flipping, number one, feeds deals to the to the burr side, um, and number and number two, it feeds money to the burr side. So um, we talk about doing the perfect burr where you can pull you know all, all your money out of that deal. Well, it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes we're left with. 10, 20, $30,000 left in these deals. So every time you do a burr, you have 20 or $30,000 that's kind of trapped. So I kind of view wholesaling and flipping as I'm throwing more logs on the fire. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to build this big fire that kind of sustains itself. Um, but, but until it gets to the point where it'll sustain and, and just kind of keep growing on its own, uh, wholesaling and flipping kind of keeps, keeps the cash keeps the cash being um, kind of fed, fed to the beast. Yeah. It's kind of like a, a engine, like one of those old coal engines when you, and you had to feed the coal into the, into the burner. That's like, so you're, you're going out, you're going out and flipping houses. And for you, if I understand it right, it's maybe three to five deals per year. Is that still the kind of the, the number of flips that you would do? Or is it more than that at this point? For, for flips? Yeah. This year we'll, we're probably on track for three to five. Um, and then we're doing a decent amount of wholesaling, um, well, my, my goals are to do about 20 wholesales and then about five flips and then about five, um, buy and holds. And from a, from buy and hold standpoint, we're only trying to do, um, multifamily right now. Got it. So you, you've got your volume up, which is cool. So you're, so you, you wholesale properties and for people who aren't familiar with wholesaling, this is you know, Kyle's out looking at a lot of deals and not every one of them fits his model for buy and hold rentals. So maybe it's a single family that cash flow is not great, but he, he's got some margin on it. Then you flip that house in the wholesaling, you just sell it to another investor who might want to keep that or another homeowner who wants a good deal. Is that, is that, is that your customer there? You're finding deals to below value, flipping into them for five grand or 10 grand or something. Is that a, is that in the right business model there? Yeah. Yeah. So if it's a wholesale, um, or it's, sorry, if it's a single family, we're going to look to either flip it or wholesale it. Mm -hmm. Um, if it's in kind of like more of a suburban, like nice, nicer area where, um, the end buyer would typically be, you know, like a, like a first time home, home buyer or something like that. Those are ones we're going to look to buy and flip. Um, if it's like a kind of a, a 
lower class area that would be more suited for a, a rental. Um, in the past, I would do a burr there. Um, but since we've kind of graduated up to trying to do burrs on like three, four, five units, um, then that's why I, I, I'm looking to wholesale those to other investors now. Cool. Got it. So, so, so back to your big picture, and I want to get into some of the details of your business model here in a second, but you, you've got this goal of accumulating rentals that produce a certain amount of cash flow. You've got this job that you've you know, traded your consulting job for a flipping job, but this flipping job makes money to pay the bills right now. It makes money to save that you can fuel your buy and hold, uh, rental business. And if you put 30000 into a burr, you're probably making a really good return, a lot better than you were on the, the turnkey. So you're still making a pretty incredible cash on cash return. Um, so you're moving forward on your long-term goal and then, but then you're also, this flipping business is your source of deals to buy your Burr properties as well. So like all three of those, are, these are all working together. It's, 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 it's very exactly. similar to, very similar to what I did as well. I'm just trying to unpack, unpack that. I, I was a wholesaler first. I flipped houses. We did that for three years before we really started buying rentals. We got a, a rental here and there. And then we, we've kind of flipped eventually where it's almost all rentals but that ability to find deals, which I think is the most important Absolutely. important skill you can get as a real estate investor. It's one of the most the biggest challenges in this market, but really any market, is being able to find deals. And you've basically built a, a profitable business around finding the deals, which fuels over the long run your rental business. And then five years from now, whether you want to keep flipping or not will just depend on whether exactly. you're, you, you, you like it, right? If you yeah. want to do it. Yeah. So, so I, I skipped a step, Kyle, and I, people might be wondering, like, all right, where are these thirty, forty, seventy thousand dollars houses that Kyle's buying? Like, tell, tell, <laughs> t tell me about the part of, tell me where you are, the part of the country you're in. I usually ask that up front. Okay, yeah. Um, so I am in Central Pennsylvania, and um, so if you're not from Pennsylvania, that doesn't mean too much to most people. But um, I actually live in Hershey, Pennsylvania. So most people have probably heard of Hershey. Um, it is the town where the chocolate is made. And actually that's where my wife works. Um, so I was born and raised here in Hershey. Uh, it's close to the state capital of Harrisburg. Um, so it's actually kind of like South central Pennsylvania. And so, I mean, the, the important question though is, do you only eat Hershey's chocolate? I mean, are you, will you go and che <laughs> cheat and have like another chocolate company somewhere else? Or is it just all Hershey? So I would say growing up, um, I, I, I didn't necessarily stick to only Hershey's. Um, but now that I have a wife that works there and she gets <laughs> like, she gets, not only does she get free candy, but like, um, she gets fresh candy. Like oh, boy. most of the, most of the candy that makes it into the store is like, you know, four or five, six months old. Um, but if you get fresh candy that was just made like last week, it does make a big difference. Hmm. That's I, I, that, that's tempting, making me want to move to Hershey. I, I'm such a big <laughs> I'm such a big chocolate fan, so that that sounds good. Um, so so you're in your middle. So her, how big of a city is Hershey, and like where you're investing, Harrisburg? I mean, what what? Tell me just a little bit about the kind of the demographics, how big it is, what people do there. Yep. So um, I think we have a great area. Uh, I don't. I, I hope that uh, our area doesn't blow up after I say something like that, but. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so state capital of Harrisburg, uh, Harrisburg has a population of about 50,000. Um, we have a couple other small cities around here. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely, there's a lot of old houses within the city, um, really where I, I like to invest. So I, if, if I get a lead that's in the, in the city, I'm typically gonna be wholesaling it. Um, if, if, we, if we get a lead that's, uh, in the city, that's typically where I'm, where I'm going to like to wholesale it. Uh, I really like to invest in the suburbs. So, uh, places like Hershey or some of the, out, some of the other outskirts of Harrisburg, Lancaster, Carlisle, just, just a couple examples of some of the cities around here. Um, like I said, they are older properties, so we really need to kind of understand, um, how to, navigate those older properties. So, and typically there's a reason why they're, they're that cheap. You know, if I, you, you know, you get these 120 year old houses for 35,000. Um, well, you know, it's, it's, I mean, like I, I, I put 40,000 into it. I probably could have put 80 into it to really bring it up to today, today's standards. So, um, 
so we we kind of have that dynamic going on with the age of the properties. Um, the other thing that really keeps property values low in our area is the surrounding. So we got a lot of density around the cities, but the surrounding areas has a lot of vacant land. Um, so really, if if property values start to come up too much, people just build a bunch of new houses and then property values will kind of come back down. So um, generally property values do creep up in, in, in our area, but we're not going to be seeing, I mean, unless it's the last 12 to 18 months. Um, <laughs> up until the last 12 to eight, 18 months, you know, we would see two or three percent um, price growth. But uh, mm. but yeah, the last the last 12 to 18 months have been very, very, very good. Yeah, it's here as well. So I'm in Clemson, South Carolina, and it's a very similar dynamic, it sounds like to you. Like we have the big city near us, big city quote in quotes is Greenville, South Carolina, which has the city itself has 60 to 80,000 probably. The metro area has 500,000. And, um, and we're kind of in the Charlotte, Atlanta area, that corridor. But we have, I've tracked my rentals over the last, you know, 18 years, and the appreciation rate's been like two and a half to three. You know, that sounds, sounds very similar. Yeah. And so I, so I always like to talk about this because I, I get, you know, there's people all over the country and you and I are in a market that is, if you looked at a rental property, like we might have a goal and let's just say real simple numbers to buy a property that if you paid cash for it might have a 7% return, 8% return. I mean, that's not uncommon to see like a cap rate in that, that range. I'm not sure what, if you see that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, like so, if you but if you if you add in, in the appreciation, if you just looked at your total return on that property, ignoring leverage and all that, that's like a nine to ten percent return, all in, including appreciation and and cash flow. But what's really interesting is for you and I, this the cash flow is about seven percent, six or seven percent. So like it's well over half of the return is right. from cash cash flow. And if you went to another place, if you went to Manhattan or if you went to, you know, part of anywhere in New York City, if you went to San Francisco, a lot of California, higher price markets, it's almost flipped around where if you look at the last 20 years, it, they might have had a 10 return as 10 percent return as well. But the cash flow is like three percent. And then the appreciation was five to sometimes seven percent. Right. And, and so it's just that that's kind of a fundamental that I think everybody needs to ask about their market. And why it's interesting to hear about your market. Your market is more of a cash flow market. Mine's more of a cash flow market or more, more of a balanced kind of income to price market. And there's all sorts of reasons. And one of this, you mentioned the land land availability. We have land here too, right. where there's enough supply re regulation wise and land wise for there to be new, new construction that can kind of fill that supply gap. Whereas in some areas, it just, if you're in Manhattan, like there is nowhere else to go. You can go up, but it's a huge regulatory nightmare to build a, a skyscraper. And so that's just, that's a, it's one of those fundamentals that I know you, you understand and you're studying, but just for everybody, when you're looking at a market, you got to understand what kind of market you're in. And then, because if, if you tried to apply Kyle's strategy to a 3% a, a cash flow market, it's, it's not the same approach, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. I, I do think that the, value add strategy, pretty much no matter what market you're in, if you can find deals that you can add, add value to, that's always going to work. Right. Um, which is, which is part of the reason why I just love that strategy because regardless of what the market's going to do, um, if I can go in and get a great deal below, below mark, market value and, and add value, um, I mean, it, it doesn't matter if the market stays flat or if it shoots up. I mean, if it shoots up, obviously that's better. Um, but if if you're adding value, then I mean, you're pretty you pretty much can't go wrong. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. Wherever you are, and so let's talk about that. One of your, I think um, we have a link to uh, so, uh, an article that you some questions you answered. So if people want to see the show notes, I'll have a or the podcast description. We'll have a link to some of your story and some of the your pictures of your deals. But I want to go back to your just how you found your first deal compared to how you're finding deals now. Uh, I guess you, I, so. You, you started on the MLS, right? So you just found a deal through the realtor. Talk about the the evolution to now how you find these value add deals where they actually are below value. Like, what was that transition like to go from the MLS to yeah. these off market kind of deals? Yeah, it's it's just it's like you're it's like you it's like there's a whole other world. There's a whole other world out there of off market deals, and um, from a seller standpoint, from a from a buyer standpoint, I mean, most people have no idea that there's this entire other other ecosystem of these, of these off market deals. So like, um, 
you know, there, there, there might be a deal that I come across and, and I'm like, Oh, this sounds like a great deal. I call up a cover, a couple of my, my buddies who also, also do this, this kind of thing. And they'll say, Oh yeah, I looked at that that one six months ago, but no one would have, have any idea that this property is for sale because it's not listed with an agent. So, um, anyways, to kind of back up. So when I first started, didn't, didn't know what I was doing, would always kind of rely on agents, agents to find my deals. Um, I would say the big transition happened. Um, so I, I got my first burr. It was bought through an agent. Um, and it was a semi detached. And, uh, so I share a wall with the property next door. And, um, so my contractor was there and he, he texted me. I was like out of state somewhere doing a consulting job. Um, and he texted me and he goes, he goes, dude, the other property's leaking into your house. And, uh, it, it was like, as soon as he said that, I, I, I called him and I said, don't do anything to piss him off. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to talk to him and I, I'm going to buy that property. Um, I, I just immediately was like, this is, this is an opportunity. Like, I don't care about a little bit of water. Like I, I care about buying the house next door. So, um, I flew home that Friday, pretty much went straight to the property, met the seller. So here, here it was, someone had inherited that property. It was vacant. They didn't know what they were doing. They couldn't even make like there was their mortgage payment was like, I don't know, $300 a month. They couldn't even pay that. Um, it was just this person needed, they needed an investor and, um, it just fell in my lap and I, I recognized it was an opportunity. And I said, how much do you, how much do you own the mortgage? And it was like 44,000 and here in Pennsylvania, we have to pay inheritance tax. So we had to calculate that in and, um, I bought it for 46,500. Um, so that was my first off market deal. And it was like, that was when the true light bulb went off and it was like, whoa, it was like, this person had a problem and I solved it rather than if it's listed with a, with a realtor, I'm competing with a hundred other people. And it's, it's like, it's going to be really hard to get a good deal because one chances are one of those other people are going to be willing to pay way more than me like not even close, like tens of thousands more. Um, but if, if, if you find those right people who have a problem and they need it solved fast, and if you have the tools to be able to sol solve those problems, um, then, then you can get some really good deals. Hmm. Love it. So you, you, you get this call, you're, on, you're across the country, water's coming in, you flip that around instantly and say, hey, wait a minute, like I'm going to buy this property. I think that's this is an a, opportunity. Yeah, yeah, opportunity. Yeah. Perfect. So you, so you got the bug. You said, all right, this is what, if, if this is one opportunity, I'm sure I can do this again. How did, right. and, and you're an entrepreneur, you, you're a systems guy. So I know you probably started thinking, all right, there's got to be a system here that I can turn. So what, what were some of the ways since then? You're, if you're buying yeah. 20 wholesale deals per year, you're flip, flipping three to five houses, you've taken this to another scale. Right? So what, mm -hmm. what does it look like to consistently find deals off market like you're doing? So it took me a long time to get to get to this point. So, um, so I, so like you said, I, I, I kind of got the bug. So, so I'm like, all right, well, this'll, this'll be easy. I'll send out, you know, a couple hundred postcards per month and I'll, I'll, I'll be getting all kinds of deals. So started, started sending out postcards and, uh, started getting, getting calls from people that were, that were pissed off that I was se sending a mail and, you know, all these kinds of threats that, that I was harassing them and stuff like that. And I was like, uh, this isn't, uh, exactly easy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, but I, I, I was like, you know what? I, I, I know this is possible, you, you know, like I, I know this is possible. Let's just figure out, let's just figure out what, what works. So, um, to kind of fast forward. So that was probably three years ago when I first started sending postcards, you know, and I, I had a budget of, you know, whatever, couple hundred dollars a month. Um, so nowadays we spend a lot of time and energy on our website. So we build a lot of credibility through our house buying website. So that, so that's called safe home offer. Um, so we have YouTube videos that are more geared towards sellers. We have testimonials on there. Um, 
So that's kind of like a nice, it's nice to get leads through there. And, and I, honestly, I'd, I'd rather get all my leads come through my, my website. But the other thing is that kind of supports the, the mail as well. So um, direct mail is pretty much our, the backbone of our marketing right now. Um, so we got letters. We got a much better return on letters than postcards. Um, we do alternates once in a while. We'll, we'll, you know, if we've sent someone three or four letters, we'll alternate and send them a postcard. Um, and then if someone gets a letter, you know, let's say they get five letters from different people like me and they Google each one, uh, you know, and the, the one is J Joe Schmo who's trying, who's trying to wholesale and they don't have anything on Google. And they Google us and they see, oh, safe home offer. They have 10 five-star reviews from Google. They have reviews from Yelp. They have better, better business bureau. Like all, all these things kind of give me credibility, the YouTube videos, the testimonials. Um, so I, I think the website has kind of really, really helped us convert more from direct mail. So so we've done direct mail. We've done the website. Um, we uh, this year we've kind of been experimenting with other things as well. So we did a radio ad. Um, we actually got it. We got a deal through um, that um, ra radio ad um, this year. We started cold, cold calling about a month ago. Um, and when I say we, it's it's not me. It's not. And, anyone on my team, we kind of outsource that, um, to like a, like a cold calling company. Um, so I would say those are the, those are the main things we're, we're doing right now. Like I said, direct mail is still the, the bulk of the spending. And we have, we probably have a budget of about, um, eight to eight to 12,000 per, per month that we're spending on marketing. So that was going to be my next question. Just knowing how I how my business was flipping houses and wholesaling and having a couple of people I work with who do that. It, this is a this is a big investment. Although, you know, if you if you fast forward, you look at the business model. If you wholesale twenty houses per year, even if you did 10, 10 per year and you flipped three houses per year that made twenty grand, you know, this is a, a ROI play. You know, you're, you're you correct. Marketing is your number one investment in this business. I, I'm assuming you look at it that way too, just based on the kind of the, the numbers you're running out there. Totally. Totally. And so we, we, uh, so this, the, the other thing we changed this year is, um, we, we started really tracking the numbers, um, for, for marketing. Uh, I mean, I, so I've been tracking the numbers for the rentals for so long. And, uh, I was like, why don't I have metrics for wholesaling? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but that's, I mean, that's, that's made a, a big difference as well. I mean, I mean, who knows, maybe if I, if, if I find the time, um, maybe I, I could start a website called, uh, real life wholesaling or something like that. <laughs> I, th I think there's a demand for that. I think people would, would watch it. I th there's a, probably a bigger crowd of re rental people, but, um, yeah, yeah it's, it's really smart. And I, I have a couple comments and questions. One, the, I, I love the credibility piece. Like I, um, it, it just, when I used to go out and wholesale properties and do appointments every single day, I just had a, a package I would print off, like a credibility package. And when I met with them, I would just hand them the credibility package. When I first started, I didn't have any deals. So I would say, here's my professor from college saying how great I am. Here, <laughs> here's, here's this person who's a local, you know, I played football. Here's the local football coach, which helped. Um, but to have a YouTube video, like that's so smart because they can, they can see you. Like YouTube's great for, you get to see if this person's real and if they see Kyle talking on online, like they're okay, well, I could talk to this person and then Google right. reviews that's social proof, which is one of the you know, important parts of selling anything, selling yourself is having proof that other people have worked with you. So, so smart on that part of it. The, the other question I had, so if people hear direct mail, you know, there's lots of different places you can mail this to. Do you, do you do one big list of just everybody in the whole zip code? Do you section that down a little bit? How do, how do you look at the list of people that you actually send to? So we have certain lists that we like to focus on. Um, so we have, I actually have it right, right here in front of me. So we're, we're basically looking for people with some kind of, there's a better chance that they're going to be motivated to sell. So, um, so I have a list that's called 
low financial stability. Um, so it's kind of a catch-all, but it's it, it kind of looks at their, it's not credit score, but it's something similar. Um, so if they're, you know, behind on their debts or property taxes or whatever, um, it'll give them kind of a low, they, they call it financial stability score. Um, I do expired listings, uh, anything that's multifamily, like every single multifamily and every single county around me, I'm, they're, they're going to be getting letters from me. Um, it's, it's kind of a little different marketing. It's not like a, like a we buy houses fast type of marketing. It's, mm. Hey, I'm, I'm another local investor, you know, um, we're, we're, we're building our portfolio. I put pictures of me and my partner. I put pictures of our, of our properties. Um, we actually get a lot of real, really cool deals from that. Um, but yeah, so th so things like, uh, absentee owners, uh, pre foreclosures, tax delinquent, you know, those are, those are just kind of some, some things that can, uh, that can point to potential motivation. Yeah. And, Actually, Chad, I wanted to go back to credibility. I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've walked through with a seller and they, they just immediately, they just say, I, I, I like you. I feel like I can trust you. I, I want to sell my house to you. Um, and so I, I think doing stuff online helps. Um, I think that the way you present yourself helps. I think that, you know, cause they, th these are people that they, they, they don't really know, like they, they don't really know what they need. Maybe they've called a couple other wholesalers and you know, the, the wholesaler showed up 30 minutes late or just, just like little things like that. I, I think if you go and you listen to them, you'd be respectful. You, you be yourself. Um, you kind of show them that you're like a, a real person. Uh, I, I just think it, it makes such a big difference. And I've gotten that feedback from sellers countless times. Like you, like you were the most credible, you were the most trustworthy. And I, I, I always try to ask them why. And they're just like, no, oh, you showed up on time. You told the truth. Like it's, it's really not that hard. Mm. So well said. And you, you, going back to the very beginning of your conversation, you said, I'm a, I think it's paraphrasing, but I'm a solution provider. I'm, I'm trying to figure out <clears throat> how to help people solve a problem. And you realize that with some of these off-market deals, there's a problem there. And you're, as a home buyer, you know, there's lots of people, there's lots of people trying to buy houses out there. There's realtors trying to sell houses, but we provide a unique solution. We are one of these solutions for people who need to sell a house in a certain situation. So you sounds like you're going to that with that framework of that mindset that I am a solution provider. Let me see how I can help you. How can I help you? Like, tell me how, and, and they, they sense that, right? Right. Right. And, and like, I mean, we aren't a great solution for a lot of people. So, I, I, I just view it as I, I heard this on a, on a podcast recently, um, that it's kind of like, we're, we're like a doctor. So we, we go and we have to diagnose the situation. So a doctor wouldn't prescribe the same medication, um, to like 10 different people because those, each of those individuals have different needs. Um, so you know, for me, when I go and I, I, I talk to a seller, or if I'm walking through a house with them, I mean, I've, I've walked through and I, and I just say, I, I don't think it would be a good idea for you to sell this to me. Um, and, and they're like, well, why? And, and I said, I think you can sell it with a, with a realtor and you would make way, way more. And I, I don't think it would be that hard. You know, this, this house is in good shape, you know? Um, so I've, I've had, situations like that where the seller says, well, well, geez, thank you. And then I, I walk away and we shake hands and we're, we're both happy. I've also had situations where I'll say something like that and they'll say, well, no, I, I, I can't list it with a, with a realtor because X, Y, Z. And that now I've kind of dug more into the situation and they'll tell they're now they're telling me why, why they need me. Um, so like, like I said, if you're if you're just truthful, you kind of give them your best diagnosis, your best you know your best advice. Um, then I I feel like people I feel like if you're truthful, then people will in general be truthful back. 
Yeah, agree 100%. And I found the same thing in my business that if you, particularly when you're negotiating, you just assume that there's transparency anyway. Like you just assume that they have other options. You assume, and so I, I, I took the same tact where I would just say, I, I see my, like if they ask me, you know, what do you do? Like, what's your business? And I say, well, I'm kind of like a travel agent. Like back when, this is back when travel agents actually did stuff. Like you're trying to get to this point I'm, I'm potentially helping you get there and I'm one solution. There might be other solutions. And if you'll, if you'll let us just talk about it, I'll walk through your house, I'll look at it and I will give you my best effort to tell you what my solution would be. And I'll, even if you want me to, I'll, I'll help you look at maybe what the other options would be. And you can totally. compare, you can compare those. And like, I would actually show them comps. Like here's comps for the property. If you spent 40,000 bucks, 50,000, maybe you could probably do that. And you can make more money than selling to me. Like I would just be be totally. transparent about it. And so why not? Like why why won't why wouldn't you do that forty thousand dollars worth of work? And they're like, right. well, well, I don't have the I don't have I don't, the money. I don't have forty thousand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so I think I think your approach is really smart. And it's it's it, there, there's a perception out there. I think sometimes that the only way you can get a good deal in real estate investing as an investor is to trick people or to show people that you know don't let them know. Uh, what their real value is, but you right. know, it's the day, it's the age of Zillow. Like people can look at Zillow, they can see what the uh, property value is. So there's no need, even if even if that were a best practice, which is not, that what what you're doing, Kyle, is is the the best the best approach. Not only from sleeping well at night, but totally, it's also yeah. it's also best because you're adding value. You're being the doctor. You're saying, all right, let me help you diagnose the problem. Here's one solution, and if I can't do that other solution, that's a realtor. And I often thought if I started over again as a wholesaler, I probably would have got my real estate license earlier because I, I could have made so many referrals. Like I had, I had so right. many deals like that where I was like, well, you should just list it with a realtor. If you have, do you have somebody you already want to list it with? They're like, no, I don't, I don't know anybody. So if you want a referral, here's so-and-so, the person I use to sell my houses. And you know, I could be honest about, I have a relationship with them. I make a commission as well, but right. you know, I could, that'd be a whole nother business model there, just referring people to, to real estate agents. Yeah, that is, that is something that we're trying to um, work in now. Uh, mainly with cold calling because we, we do find a lot of people um, that really do want to, they, they, they are motivated to sell their house, but you know, the ha house is in good shape. They, they don't need to sell fast. Um, so yeah, we're, we're kind of working to build our, our network um, with agents that trust us and that we, that we trust them um, and just trying to see how we can best, um, you know, uh, um, monetize that. Yeah. Well, cool. There, there's so many questions that I could go into, Kyle. I just, I love, thank you for your transparency, both on your website and here. You just, the, the, the details are always the, tell the story. And so you're, you're flipping houses, you're wholesaling, you're buying these bird deals, you're moving towards that 10,000 goal. You're getting, you've hit it a little bit. You're kind of continuing to inch towards it. Uh, I just really think it's cool how you've uh, built the system and this process and, and really, but also become an entrepreneur. And I, I want to end kind of asking a little bit about that. Um, you, you've talked some in the, in the written interview we did uh, about, you know, how did you, how do you get this entrepreneurial bug? How did you kind of get some of these skill sets? Because you're, you're doing a lot of things behind the scenes here where you leave your job, you're starting a business and that's, there's a lot to that. And I was wondering if you could tell the story about your dad and kind of some of the, uh, some of the uncommon, uh, tactics or lessons your dad used for you and your, I guess, I don't know if your, your siblings, uh, yeah. in high, even in high school that maybe led to some of this, this, uh, self-reliance that you're, you're working with now. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think a, a lot of it did, did come from my dad. Um, you know, and, uh, man, it's just, it's just one of those things when you get older and you, and you look back and I'm like, I'm like, man, like when I was in high school, I just thought my dad was just, uh, he'd, he'd just lecture me and I'd just be like, God, dad, just, you're, you're being annoying. Stop. You know? But like that, those things really, re really stuck with me. Um, so, uh, one of the coolest things my, my dad did for, um, me and my brother is our, our whole life. He said, he said, Hey, you guys are smart. I didn't go to college, but you need to go to college and you're going to figure out a way to pay for college. And he just always, you know, was telling us like, you're going to college, but you're, you're paying for it. Um, and it, it was always, you know, it, it was, it was just, Hey, you, you have to figure out a way. And it wasn't like he was saying it in a, in a bad way. It was just, you're, 
you're going to figure it out. And we, we didn't know anything different. So we just thought, oh, okay, like th this is what we got to do. So, um, we like, we started a, a landscaping business for like mowing lawns, mulch, mulch of people's flower beds and in high school and college, um, paid most of our way through college using that. But we also had to kind of like hunt for scholarships. And I was, you know, networking around campus, just trying to, trying to find $5,000 here, $10,000 there. Um, and, you know, I made it work. And it, I honestly, to me, it, it wasn't that big of a deal. It was like, hey, like I was able to go and start a start a business. And I, I, I honestly felt like I had more money than most of my friends because it was mine. Um, so on the day I graduated, he sat me down. And he said, he said, all right, Kyle, you learned how to make this work for yourself. And that was the biggest lesson that I've that I wanted you to learn. He said, I, I wanted you to do this by yourself and basically know that um, anything that you that you want to do in life, you can you can do by yourself if you if you figure it out. But he said, I, I also wanted to help you pay for college. So I wanted both. I wanted you to learn the lesson and I wanted to help you. So um, so when I when I graduated, he gave me like fifty thousand um, dollars. So he's like he's like I'm I'm reimbursing you for for college. Um, but you also had that, that, that life lesson of kind of learning how to do it yourself, which, which was awesome. What an amazing story. And, you know, I think I have eight, an eight year old and a 10 year old and uh, you're, you're a parent as well. You, you, you start looking back on some of the lessons and obviously you had a very, very fortunate to have somebody who taught you positive lessons about self-reliance, just about, and it, there's so many skills you can learn and we think about as parents, but being able to give your, your kid the gift of finding their own strengths and finding their own ability to solve problems. I, I can't think of a more helpful lesson to go into adulthood with than your dad gave you. Totally. Totally. Cool. Thank you for that story. Thank you. There's lots of, we could talk about Maybe We can have a follow-up conversation at some sure. point, but I uh, really appreciate it. I, I want people to check you out and follow your, what you're doing online. Could you give people a handoff on if they want to pay attention to your rental properties, see all your numbers, follow along with your story, where, where can people hang out with you online? Sure. So, um, my house buying website is called safe home offer. Um, my, uh, kind of like my like diary type website, it's called real life rentals. Um, so that's where I started really tracking all the numbers on each, on each individual property, as well as my overall portfolio. I've got some really cool like graphs and tables and stuff on, on, on there. Um, just kind of telling the story of how the portfolio is doing on a, um, month by month basis. Um, I'm also pretty active on Twitter, so you can find me at, um, real life rentals on Twitter. Uh, I, I try to put pictures up and just kind of talk about talk about deals that I'm doing as well. Yeah, I've I've got more than Twitter, not as a promotion vehicle, but that's my one vehicle that I go I, my my splurge in social media. I go I follow guys like Kyle, I follow some other people just to to see what's going on out there. It's it's uh, yep. so definitely definitely follow Kyle. And um, I'll put links to all of that in the show notes. I'll also put a link to the companion article that Kyle wrote. So you can see some more depth and some pictures and some before and afters of his, his story. Um, the final question I want to ask you, Kyle, this is what I ask all my guests. This is a show about financial independence. It's helping people get financial independence. And people are at all sorts of different parts of their journey, but particularly those who are early in their journey where they're just getting started. Maybe they're paying off debt. They're just getting into the entrepreneurship game. Do you have any final advice for, those, for people at that stage of the game? I think my big thing is to start, start with the end in mind. So um, like, like we talked about pretty much at the, at, at, at the beginning of the, of the podcast, um, you know, to define what, what success looks like, not just from a, from a number standpoint, but like, how does it, how does it feel like, um, you know, what's your, what's your perfect day feel like? And like, you know, what do you want your life to really look like and feel like in, five, 10 years, um, and then work, work backwards from there. So if it's $10,000 a month in passive income, and I live in a lake house and I am with, with my kids every day and I'm coaching their baseball teams or wrestling teams or, you know, football teams or, or whatever, um, I'm fish, I'm fishing all the time or I'm golfing on, you know, whatever, 
whatever you really want to do in life, um, really define what that looks like and feels like, and then, and then work backwards and say, okay, to get there in 10 years, uh, I need to add a thousand dollars a month in passive income each year. Okay. Well, how many properties do I need to, to add a thousand dollars a month? So if it's, 250 per property, then I need to buy four properties per year. Okay. That's my, that's my goal for this year. Buy four properties. Um, so it's begin with the end in mind, work backwards. Very well said, Kyle. So thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking. Hope we can do it again. And uh, best of luck with the rest of your deal finding, following up with that seller that we were okay. talking about earlier. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Chad. All right. Take care, Kyle. If you like more details about today's guest, Kyle McCorkle, or any of the links or resources we discussed during the interview, please check out the link to the show notes, either in the podcast description below or in the video description on YouTube. And if you're new here, please consider hitting the subscription button on your favorite podcast player or on YouTube so that you won't miss anything. I have new episodes that come out every Monday morning. This is also the part of the show when I give away a copy of my book, Retire Early with Real Estate, to one person who recently left a review of the podcast on Apple Podcast. This week's winner goes by the username Reed J. Huddleston. The review was left on June 29th, 2021, and it's short and sweet, but it goes like this. Great show, lots of great wisdom through Chad's experience in real estate, plus his guest. So thank you so much for that review, Reed. Please send us an email at podcast at coachcarson.com, and we will be happy to get you a copy of my book, Retire Early with Real Estate for free. Keep in mind that everything I've shared with you in this episode has been for general education purposes. I have not considered your specific situation or risks. Before buying your own investments, be sure to consult a financial, real estate, and or legal professional. Until next time, my name is Chad Carson. I'm your host for the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast. You, of course, can also call me Coach. And this is a show all about investing in real estate, achieving financial independence, and doing more of what matters. See you next time.